Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. This is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come before you again this morning and we ask for your help as we seek to open up your word. Lord, we desire for you to be honored and glorified through the truth of your word. You say in Psalm 119, 104 that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That all men are like grass and all the glory of the field will wither. But your word will stand forever. So Lord, help us to believe and to trust your word, the truth of your word. Help us to live according to it. As a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who speaks that you have chosen to speak to us through this ancient book. And we want to hold fast to your word. And Lord, live according to it. Lord, I pray for those in our midst who are strangers of grace. That Lord, were they to die this morning, they would die outside of your saving promises. That Lord, they would hear the truth of your word this morning and see the glory and beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and they would fly to him and find eternal life in him. Lord, I pray that you would do this glorious work by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would help me to move out of the way and be forgotten and that all those in this room might stand before you, the living God. And that there might be an aroma of Christ that would be sweet to our nostrils. And that we would embrace your grace. Oh Lord, work through your word this morning for the glory of your name. Amen. Two years ago, the politicians in Flint, Michigan, made a decision to get water, drinking water, from the Flint River rather than the reservoir that they had been taking water from. And this was supposed to save thousands of dollars. Uh, But what happened in the process was that... uh, people began to be exposed to lead in their drinking water. And so thousands of people in Flint, Michigan, were quenching their thirst, drinking water, cooking with that water that had lead in it. And no doubt, unperceptively drinking away, not realizing that they were poisoning themselves that they were making their bodies toxic with lead. Well, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 16 wants to warn us about poison. And it's uh, not a, a popular thing that he warns us about. He's going to warn us about false teaching. And it's at the end of a section in Romans chapter 16 where the Apostle Paul is giving his final greetings to the church and churches in Rome. 
And it's a, it's a very warm greeting that he, he gives to the people that he knows in this, these churches in Rome. There's some 27 names on this list. And, and you remember the Apostle Paul, in writing the book of Romans, he's aiming to unite the Jewish and Gentile Christians under the banner of the gospel. And he, he gives this closing greeting and it's filled with warmth and love and tenderness that he has for all the believers in Rome. And we, we've seen in the previous weeks how, how that uh, there was all kinds of diversity in the church at Rome. Some of the people on the list were slaves. Some were politicians. Uh, that some were Jewish and some were Gentile. But they're all united in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, he closes out that list of greetings in verse 16. And says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So this section is so gushy. So spilling over with love that the Apostle Paul wants them to greet one another with a holy kiss. And it's almost as if the Apostle Paul, as he's dictating this letter to a man named Tertius, which we'll see in a couple weeks from now, it's almost like he, he glances down and looks at how much parchment or scroll he has left on whatever Tertius was writing on, and he realizes he, he's coming to an end here, and he hasn't warned the churches in Rome about the poison. He hasn't warned them about false teaching. While he has labored for 16 chapters to explain the gospel and defend the gospel and, and, and knock down every objection against this gospel to unite the, the believers in Rome under the gospel, he hasn't warned them about false teaching that could pervert, twist the gospel. And so, it seems almost out of place. It seems abnormal. But Paul takes a break from this final greeting and he warns them about false teaching. He warns them, he tells them what they look like and he gives them two dominating instructions in relationship to them. Number one, look out for them. Spot them. And then turn away from them. Separate yourself from them. Shy away from them. Turn away from them. Now, before we get into this section where Paul gives this warning about false teachers, I want us to ponder, uh, to, to kind of explode a couple of assumptions that, don't, don't, that, that I believe this passage just kind of explodes. Assumptions that, that we normally just kind of assume in our kind of uh, Christian subculture. The first is that discerning false teaching and calling it out is contrary to love. Do you see that in here in Romans chapter 16? Because as I mentioned before, Romans 16 is ushi and gushi with love, right? <laughs> I mean, Paul loves these people. He's telling them to kiss one another. He's telling them to greet one another. He knows them by name. He remembers some of them who laid down their lives for him. They, he says, remember about Priscilla and Aquila? They put their necks on the line for me. They're good people. He talks about Rufus. And he says, uh, and greet your mother for me. And, and she's my mother as well. Because we're family. I mean, this is a ushy, gushy, maybe the gushiest section of the New Testament, right? It's just spilling over and oozing with warmth and love and affection. And it's in the midst of this section that Paul gives this stern warning about false teaching. And the temptation might be to think that, that this warning about false teaching is indeed contrary to everything that's preceded it in Romans 16. But it's not at all. It's only if you have a misunderstanding of love. If your understanding of love is, is this kind of, this sentimentalism that's just okay with everything, then yeah, it's contrary to what Paul has been saying here. But that's not what biblical love is. Biblical love seeks the best good of those who are the object of that love. 
And the Apostle Paul, in the midst of his ushy and gushy feelings towards the churches in Rome, loves them so much that he warns them about potential danger. I mean, think about it. Is it unloving for a parent to know what registered sex offenders live in the neighborhood and to make sure their children aren't wandering around their house? Is that considered contrary? Oops, alarm. <laughs> Is that considered contrary to love for a parent to keep an eye out on any potential danger that their children might be in and to shy them away, to turn away from that danger? No, not at all. That's the epitome of love. If a parent cares for their children, they don't want them to walk in danger. They don't want them to be exposed to something that would be harmful and destructive. And so the Apostle Paul, in raising his voice or lifting his pen through Tertius here, and warning about false teaching is doing the most loving thing he can do at this point. So that warning about false teachers is the outflow of his love for the believers in Rome. Not only that, there's often an underlying kind of assumption that you, if you're going to be concerned about doctrinal purity, clear teaching, doctrinal distinctives, it's going to be contrary to unity. You can't have unity in a concern for doctrine at the same time. You can't have unity in a concern for right teaching and right theology at the same time. That's another, I think, idea that needs to be slapped with some C4 and exploded. Because the Apostle Paul, I believe one of his primary aims in the book of Romans is to unite the believers. Remember, uh, remember chapter 14 15? He's all about talking to them about unity and unity and have peace amongst one another. And he's also warning them about those, these false teachers, his first description in verse 17, he says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions, or some of your translations may say divisions. He describes these false teachers as causing division. But you know, you want to see something very interesting here? Notice what his exhortation to them is. Verse 17, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned, and notice this, and turn away from them. Divide from them. In other words, true biblical unity, yes, requires division, but it's a division with a view to have unity. <laughs> it's a division to have unity. And so while you do have to divide from false teaching, it's so that the body of Christ and the truth, those who are surrounding themselves with the truth, will have better unity and won't be divided by air. And so that unity is not contrary to a desire for doctrinal purity. I remember years ago, I was invited to a planning meeting for a large gathering of Christian men here in Mahoning Valley. And uh, it was at this planning meeting that uh, they were discussing uh, plans for this large gathering. And, and I remember a, an older gentleman throwing his fist down on the table and saying, there's no doctrine here. We believe in Jesus. Jesus is our doctrine. Oh, okay. He said, if we're going to have unity here, it's just Jesus. And I started to think, well, what Jesus? I mean, because the Muslims believe in Jesus, the Mormons believe in Jesus, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe in Jesus, even many atheists believe Jesus existed. <laughs> So immediately, once you start asking who is Jesus, you, you dive into the area of doctrine. Was he God? Was he God-man? Was he just a prophet? 
And so it's impossible, even for, with the desire to be so minimalistic in your doctrine, you're going, you can't avoid those doctrinal questions. What does the Bible teach as to who Jesus is? And you're going to make a decision, whether it's so minimal that you're allowing all kinds of false teaching and error and things that, that would lead people astray and into even horrible teachings that may even lead them into the judgment of God. You're going to make a decision at some point. Where do you divide the line? Now, obviously, in the book of Romans, Paul has warned about dividing that, making that dividing line too narrow. In Romans 14 and 15, there were some who wanted to divide over matters of food and drink and holidays, some who celebrated the Jewish holidays. And so there is a kind of unhealthy uh, divisiveness in pursuit of the truth and doctrinal purity. But also there is an um, important reality that there is false teaching that denies cardinal, fundamental, basic Christian truth that cannot be tolerated amongst God's people. Cannot be tolerated in the sense of accepted and believed. But even the Apostle Paul would say, point it out and shy away from it, turn away from it. So those are kind of clearing the rubble here in Romans 16, that, that pursuit of Doctrinal purity and, and having right biblical beliefs is not contrary to love. It's a loving thing to be concerned about truth and concerned that others are hearing and believing God's truth. It's not contrary to unity, right biblical unity. In order to have right biblical unity, there does need to be a pursuit of doctrinal purity that may mean, yes, dividing from falsehood and error, but that's right biblical unity. So then... What's Paul's description of these false teachers here? What do they look like so we can keep eyes out and, and obey Paul's instruction? Well, let me give you some characteristics here. I, I have five listed here. I don't know if we're going to get to all five this morning. Number one, these false teachers are divisive. I told you they begin with a D. They're divisive. Then we see this in verse 17. He says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions. On those who cause dissensions. Now notice, first of all, and I think this is important, who is Paul talking to here? How does he address them in verse 17? He says, now I urge you, what? Brethren. He's talking to fellow believers. If we were to rewind the scroll all the way back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 1 and verse 2, Paul is writing to the saints in Rome, the believers in Rome. He's writing to brothers and sisters. He's writing to church members. Now this is significant because while on the one hand it is the responsibility of church leaders to be informed about false doctrine, false teaching, in fact, you, according to Titus, Titus says one of the requirements of an overseer is that he's able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. So uh, a, a church leader has to be not only able to understand false teaching, but to refute it. Okay, That's required amongst church leaders. But it's also required amongst every person in the body of Christ to obey Romans sixteen seventeen. Which namely, what does he say here? He says, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions. And then he says at the end of verse 17, turn away from them. Don't bend your ear towards them. Don't listen to them. Shy away from them. Don't buy their books. Don't listen to their teachings. Mark them out and shy away from them. So this is important. So this, this kind of brings it down to everybody's level. You may be one of those who, who you know, don't think it's that important for you to understand the theology and doctrine. But it's really the responsibility of every believer, every believer in the Lord Jesus to have discernment. I mean, think of it even on a basic level. If you're a parent, I mean, you have a responsibility as to what your children are hearing and listening to and believing and embracing. 
And so no doubt you're going to want to have discernment. You know, is this, is this a good program for my child to be watching? Right? We make those decisions as parents. But every child of God, everybody in God's family has a personal responsibility to keep an eye out for those who, according to this verse, cause division. They cause division. That's what he says here in verse 17. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions. They divide the body of Christ. They, they draw people away from the truth and cause division within the church. This is a very serious thing. In fact, the, the word, you may not know this, the very word heresy means division. It means divisiveness. And that's always what false teaching does. It, it causes a division. It draws a line and tries to pull people away from the truth. And it fractures God's people. It divides them, turns them away from the truth, turns them towards and against one another. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says when Luke records his his admonition and warning to the church leaders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. He's talking to these pastors, these elders. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he, purposed, which he purchased with his own blood. So Paul exhorts, he says, be on guard you're like shepherds and there is a flock. Be watchful. Be on guard for yourself. Take, take care of your own spiritual well-being. Make sure you're believing rightly. Make sure you're teaching rightly. Make sure you're living rightly. And then he says this in the next verse. He says, I know that after my departure, after I leave here, savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will rise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. People will speak false things to draw away disciples after them. And so they're going to divide the church, but they're wolves. They're not fellow shepherds. They're not leading you towards Christ and greater Christ likeness. They're leading you to themselves so that they can devour you and draw you away. False teachers cause dissension, division, drawing away people, drawing people away from the truth, causing division within the body of Christ. Remember Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, if you destroy the temple of God, and he's talking about the church in that context, God will destroy you. It's a very serious thing to fracture the church of God with false teaching. And of course, it's not, I get it, it's not popular in our postmodern culture to say, that's false, that's a lie. You know, people say, oh, that's so unloving. You're not being nice. But yet the Apostle Paul corrects our thinking here. Lifts us out of our own kind of cultural assumptions and says, no, we need to be concerned about truth. We need to keep our eye on false teachers and shy away from them. Now you may think, well, Matt, I don't have that much time to be able to know all the different false teachings that are out there. And I don't know that it's necessarily the job of every Christian to necessarily know every false teaching that's out there. It can be helpful to, have, to be informed about some of the different uh, false religions and false teachings that are out there. It can be helpful to be sure, but the important thing is to know the truth. Because just like those young people this morning, when they saw a fake bill, how did they know it was fake? Well, they've seen mommy and daddy pull out the real stuff. And that didn't look like the real stuff. Right? 
And so the more you know the truth of God's word, the more equipped you will be able to discern falsehood. So, are you committed to knowing God's truth? I think one of the biggest obstacles to that, I know in my own life, is, is laziness, right? It's, it's hard, you know, to think through different, you know, what does the Bible say? I mean, even in your, take for instance your regular Bible reading, right? It's hard to really actually think about what does it say? What does that mean, right? It requires some mental sweat. And, it, and it's easy to just kind of gloss over and just read the, the ink on the page and not actually try to know what it says. But yet, this is what the Lord would have for us. Remember, the Apostle Paul, remember the list that he's talking, he's, he's writing to slaves. He's writing to uneducated people. But he holds them to a standard of, you need to understand God's word. In fact, th- notice what he says in, in verse 19. He says, I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. I take that wise in what is good to be skilled in your understanding of God's good word. Now, you don't necessarily have to be well versed in all the evils that are out there, but to be wise and skillfully and uh, skillful in understanding God's word. That you do need to be. Well, these false teachers, they're divisive. They're also destructive. Notice what it says in the second part of verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances. Now, some of your translations, at least the the New American Standard and the marginal reading, you see the little number one next to hindrances, and you look over in the margin, it says occasions of stumbling, or some of your translation may say offenses. Some translation may say stumbling blocks. The, the word here carries the idea of a trap. Some kind of teaching that would be a trap that would like snap down on an unsuspecting animal and catch them. And when you get caught in the trap, what is the end game of the trap? It's for that animal to be somebody's lunch, somebody's dinner, right? The end game of the trap is to be destroyed, to be devoured. And the father of lies, Satan, he wants all of his lies and falsehood to drag people down to hell with him. And so he loves to deceitfully disseminate his destructive lies that people would believe and wind up dying in that unbelief, not believing the truth, but believing a lie, and ultimately to be sentenced to the lake of fire with him. This is what... Paul is talking about here when he talks about these offenses or these stumbling blocks. Listen to the way in which Jesus uses this word uh, translated here as hindrances. In Matthew 13, 20 and 21 says, he's talking about the parable of the sowers, the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word immediately and receives it with joy. Verse 21, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. What is translated, he falls away, he stumbles, he gets trapped. He turns away from the Lord when persecution or affliction comes. He, in, in other words, he apostatizes, he turns away from the truth. It's a very serious word here. Jesus says something similar in Matthew 18, 8 and 9. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than for you to have two hands or two feet and to be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, same word here, pluck it out and throw it away from you, for it is better for you to enter with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. So Jesus used this word stumbling block or hindrances to speak of something that may cause you to trip and go to hell. 
One more, Revelation 2.14, Jesus in his letter to the churches. He says, I have a few things against you because you have, you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, some kind of false teaching, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idol and commit acts of immorality. So in Revelation 2.14, he's saying this is the problem with, with this church here. You tolerate false teaching that's like Balaam's false teaching of the Old Testament. And what did Balaam do? He put a stumbling block before people to lead them away from the truth. He was trying to bring Israelites away from trusting in the true and living God. And this is what this false teaching is like. And so Jesus, in a very similar context as the Apostle Paul here in Romans 16, uses this word, I believe, stumbling block, to carry the idea of some lie, some twist on the truth that is damnable, that is destructive. So it's a serious matter here. Now, not all lies are equally damnable. I mean, somebody can be wrong about something and it's less important than another thing. But there are some things that are so important, and the New Testament makes that clear, that if you believe this lie and depart from the truth here, there's eternal consequences. For instance, I mean, we've talked in previous weeks about Al Mohler's doctrinal triage, uh, how there's some essential doctrines and there's some less important doctrine and then there's some doctrines that are also less important but they, they, they do necessarily cause us to be in different local churches. But some of those essential doctrines, l listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 when he's writing to the church in Galatia and there was a group in the church who was saying, well, it's good that you believe in Jesus. You trust in, in Jesus as your Messiah. You believe he died on the cross for you. That's good. But if you're really going to be acceptable before God and you're, you're, you're a Gentile male, you need to be circumcised. You need to follow the law of Moses in order to be acceptable before God. So it's Jesus plus obedience to the law that makes one acceptable before God. Listen to what Paul says about that. And this is one of those introductions to the letter to the Galatians where he, he kind of uh, sets aside all the niceties that he normally uh, gives to the churches and he, and he launches right into his warning towards them. He says in Galatians 1.6, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you who, and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And then he says this, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we preach to you, he is to be accursed. And then he says it again. He says, if I or an angel from heaven preaches another gospel, the gospel that I preached to you before, that business about Jesus dying on the cross, that he is the only way for a sinner to be accepted before God, and you must lay hold of what he did on the cross by faith. If you preach any message other than that, or if I preach any message, or yea, if an angel with wings came down from heaven and stood before you and preached the message contrary to that, he says, let him be accursed. Let him be eternally damned is the idea. So any departure from the gospel is something in the apostles' own words that is damnable. It's destructive. It sends people to hell. And so again, you can see why this is such a serious matter. You can see why the apostle Paul, in writing this letter, comes to the end and realizes, I've, I haven't warned them yet. <laughs> I need to warn them. And he almost like frantically has Tertius, you know, make sure you get this warning in here before I conclude this letter because they need to know that there are damnable, destructive lies out there that if they believe, they will go to hell with those false teachers. 
Now, you may be sitting here this morning thinking, wow, I mean, why is this such a big deal? I mean, why can't we just, you know, like have the Rodney King theology? Why can't we just get along? You know, why, why do we all have to make all this fuss about having right belief, right doctrine? Well, hopefully you're able to see from Galatians 1 why it's so important. It's so important because there's certain things, if you distort the remedy, then it ends up in destruction. I mean, for whatever reason in our culture, we take this approach when it comes to religion that, you know, well, it doesn't really matter that we don't take that approach in really any other realm of life. You know, I mean, does somebody who's, uh, if you're sick and, uh, you know, there's some kind of cure or some kind of medicine, some kind of procedure out there, do you take the approach? Well, you know, it doesn't really matter what kind of surgery it is, you know, as long as it's surgery, right? It doesn't really matter what kind of medicine it is, you know, as long as it's medicine. No. You know, if, if you get diagnosed with coronary artery disease because you have blockages in your heart and the doctor's talking about a lobotomy, you're saying, whoa, hold the phone here. Wait a second. It's my heart. And not my head that needs worked on. You're concerned about having the right solution here when you know that, yeah, there's all kinds of different surgical procedures, there's all kinds of different medicines, but you want the right one. Well, in a similar way, all of humanity is sick with sin. We've all fallen in Adam. We are rebels against our creator. We do not obey God as we ought to, even when we come up with our own moral code that we've invented. We can't even live up to that standard. We don't speak the truth to one another. We lie. We don't honor our parents like we should. Our culture is filled with adultery, murder, Anger, rage, lust, covetousness, thievery. We've rebelled against our creator. And we are sick. And God, in the wonder of his mercy, has sent the Lord Jesus 2,000 years ago. And he's been clothed in humanity as the eternal God. And he came down to this earth. And he lived a perfect life on this earth without sin. And he died on that Roman cross and was punished not for his own sin, but for the sins of others. So that if anybody trusts and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved, delivered from the lake of fire. Anyone who trusts and repents and yields to him as their Lord, as their master, he promises full forgiveness and acceptance. You see, that's the solution. That's the solution for our dire predicament against the holy God that we deserve his judgment. And the one solution is found in Christ who said himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. He is that one solution. And so if we say, well, it doesn't really matter, you know, what, you know, what the solution is. No, it matters. And Paul here says, you tweak that solution, it's a hindrance, it's a stumbling block. People will trip their way into hell. And so, my friend, you may be sitting here this morning and not understanding why this is so important, but I want to tell you it's important. It's eternally important that we don't lose this glorious gospel solution, that we contend for it when necessary, not because we love a good fight, but because the gospel, if we lose the gospel, then people will perish. Well, first characteristic, this gospel or this, this false teaching, 
It's divisive, draws people away from the truth. It's also destructive when you depart from a major doctrine, a major belief. It's destructive. But then thirdly, it's departing, departing from the doctrine. This is what we see in verse 17, which looks like we're not going to get beyond verse 17. <clears throat> now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances. Notice this. Here's another description. Contrary to the teaching which you learned. And turn away from them. Contrary to the teaching which you have learned. So this is very similar to what he says in, in Galatians chapter one. If anybody comes to you with another gospel other than the one that we preach to you, other than what you have learned. Now what had they learned? Paul had, hadn't visited the church in Rome, but he knew people who were in the church in Rome and he knew what they knew. He knew what they believed. In fact, if you drop your eyes down to Romans 15, just one chapter to the left in verse 15, he says, but I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God. So he's saying I've written to you boldly as, as a reminder. In other words, he's saying what I've written here in this letter, these 16 chapters, I've written as a reminder. You already know this stuff. You understand it. You believe it. And so I think we can safely conclude when he says in verse 17 of chapter 16 that these false teachers, <coughs> they teach things that are contrary to the teaching which you have learned, <coughs> that we can use the book of Romans as an acid test of what kind of contrary teachings there would be. So if we started way back at the beginning of the book of Romans, in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul is laying out man's sinfulness. Man's rebellion against God, or the theological term might be total depravity, that man is corrupt, man is sinful, man is a rebel against God. Remember, was it Romans 3, 9 and following? He says, uh, there's none good, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. All have turned aside. It's not a very pretty picture of man, right? There's, there's your teaching, your doctrine. Doctrine just means teaching. There's your teaching about man. And if you depart from a right biblical teaching of man, it's destructive. There's someone who said, having a right understanding of who man is, it's like buttoning up your shirt. It's that first button on the shirt. If you get that first button wrong, Everything else is wrong. You got to start all over, right? There's a lot of bad teaching out there, false teaching that denies man's sinfulness. And again, I understand it's not popular in our culture, but this is what the Bible teaches. And by the way, this is our own experience as well, right? I mean, if, you've, if you're a parent, it's your own experience, right? Because you didn't have to teach your child how to lie. You didn't have to teach your child how to put the other one in a headlock. You didn't have to teach your child any of those things. It came very natural to them. Why? Because we're all born rebels. The center of our own universe. And so to depart from that teaching would be contrary to the teachings that they had learned. Also, what about God's judgment, God's wrath? That's what he lays out in, in Romans. In fact, if you look at Romans chapter 2 at the beginning, he says, uh, 2, 4, he says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath in the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He's saying the way in which you turn your nose up at God's kindness and your stubbornness and your unrepentance is laying up wrath for the day of wrath. 
It's speaking about God being a God of judgment, a righteous judgment, a righteous anger. <clears throat> if you depart from the reality of God's judgment, the reality of eternal hell, you've departed from those things that Apostle Paul says you've learned. You guys know these things. How about God as Trinity? We see that throughout Romans. We see Jesus spoken of as God in Romans chapter 9. Obviously the Father's God. We see Romans 8. Spirit's work is put on level with the Father and the Son's work and the work of salvation. We see God as Trinity throughout the book of Romans. You depart from God as Trinity. You've entered into destructive teaching. There's people out there who even are called evangelical Christians who deny God as Trinity. Someone like T.D. Jakes doesn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. A group like Phillips, Craig, and Dean deny God as Trinity. How about the substitutionary atonement of Christ? Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because of the forbearance of God. He passed over the sins previously committed. We see Jesus here described as a propitiation, one who appeased the wrath of the Father as a substitute for sinners. It's a pretty basic teaching here in Romans. And if you deny that, you wind up landing yourself in false teaching. How about justification by faith alone? Look at Romans 3. It says uh, in verse 27, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law, by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the same thing that Paul was dealing with with the Galatian false teaching. That people were adding to faith. They're saying faith plus obedience to the law makes one acceptable before God. Paul says, no, that's another gospel. Also we see in Romans chapter 6, Paul lays out when a person is truly justified, sin is dethroned in their life. And that makes things like easy believism or non-lordship salvation as a very destructive thing. The certainty of a believer's salvation we see in Romans chapter 8. We can go on and on. Now, we understand that when we get to Romans 14 and 15, there are some areas of disagreement amongst Christians that they shouldn't divide over. That, that, that Paul brings up that matter of meat that, that had been uh, uh, different dietary laws and different holy days and things like There are certain things that Christians ought not to ought to divide over but there are certain things that are non-negotiable and if we negotiate them we wind up losing the gospel and Paul in Romans 16 17 he says keep your eye out on those who are doing this and stay away from them turn away from them don't listen to their teachings don't read their books by the way it's one of the reasons why we have a room over there filled with books. Because do you want to know one of the most dangerous places a Christian can go today? is the Christian bookstore. Because that Christian bookstore, as well-meaning as it may be, they're trying to stay afloat. And the book business is not a lucrative business these days. That's why there's all these trinkets when you walk in. You know, trinkets for this, trinkets for that. But also, 
They're trying to sell books. And they're not, in 90% of the cases, there may be some Christian bookstores out there that are discerning, that hold the line, or we're, we're not going to have these kinds of books. But what happens when a Christian goes in the Christian bookstore versus when a Christian goes to Barnes & Nobles, they know they're in Barnes & Nobles, right? <laughs> they realize, I'm in Barnes & Nobles. I, I, I'm not just going to pick up any Christian book here and, and, and that's under the guise of Christianity and believe that it's necessarily Christian truth. And so the, the baloney detector is active, right? <laughs> but when the Christian goes in the Christian bookstore, baloney detector is off. Why? Well, I'm in a Christian bookstore and there's nice people here and they smile. And so baloney detectors off, you know, pick up people who pervade a prosperity gospel. Jesus died to make you healthy, wealthy, and happy. People who deny God as Trinity. People who deny justification by faith alone. And baloney detectors off. And so... Now, keep in mind, I'm not into book burning, <laughs> things like that. Uh, it can be even helpful to have some, again, knowledge of the false teaching that's out there. If I die and you're rummaging through my library, you will find a section of books <laughs> that are not books that I believe. They're books that I read to understand what false teachers believe, okay? Okay. You know, you'll find the Book of Mormon in there. You'll find all kinds of Jehovah's Witness writings in there, things like that. So don't, you know, think that Matt apostatized because he had those in his library. But we want to be careful what we give an ear to. We want to we want to handle false teaching the same way a chemist handles poison. Very carefully. I'm not going to say, oh, let me see how that tastes. <laughs> yes, analyzing it, looking at how it reacts with other certain chemicals and things like that, but always careful to keep something of a distance and something of protection between him and that lie, between him and that chemical. He may have a, a visor over his eyes to protect his eyes. He, he has gloves in his hands, analyzing, but... Very careful not to ingest. Remember, Paul is exhorting all the believers in Rome. He says in verse 17, I urge the brethren to keep an eye out on those who cause dissensions and hindrances and depart from the teaching which they have learned. Stay away from them. Stay away from them. J.C. Ryle was a champion for the truth in the Church of England during the 19th century. He wrote a little book called Warnings to the Churches in which he goes through Jesus' exhortation to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And he says this, well, he writes that it's difficult yet necessary for the church to engage in controversy. And then he adds, but there is one thing which is even worse than controversy, that false doctrine is tolerated, allowed, and permitted without protest, or molestation. And then after acknowledging that many would view what he writes as exceedingly distasteful, he states this, quote, three things which men ought to never trifle with. A little poison, a little false doctrine, and a little sin. Paul says, look out for it and stay away from it. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, Lord, these are challenging things to hear to our ears. And while we don't want to be self-righteous or pugnacious or love a fight for the sake of the fight, Lord, we do need to discern false teaching. We do need to stay away from it. Help us, Lord. 
Help us to have discernment with Bibles in our hands. Discerning truth from error. Help us not be swallowed up by the lies of what what is uh, disseminated under the banner of Christianity. Help us to discern even the lies of the culture around us that are so easily imbibed by us because it's the, the water we swim in. Help us to, as you say in Romans 12, 2, to not be conformed to this world, but, by, but to be renewed in our minds for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.